Hello, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation here today for another in our series called Conversations with Giants in Medicine. Today in the United States, more than 6,000 people a year receive a liver transplant, and since the liver transplants have begun, over 200,000 patients have received this therapy. They survive today due to the efforts of a legendary scientist and surgeon who joins us today, Dr. Thomas Starzl of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He performed the first successful liver transplant in 1967 and refined the use of immunosuppressive drugs such that patients could tolerate their grafts some for decades. With Dr. Starzl's efforts over the last 50 to 60 years, thousands of patients with end-stage liver disease have been able to lead long and active lives. We're delighted to have you here today and to hear a little bit about your path through medicine and science. Do you think you could start by telling us a little bit about how you got to medical school and about your path uh, of discovery to that point? Well, I got to medical school um, uh, via the Navy. Um, uh, by that I mean uh, I went from high school into the Navy for about a year and a half. Uh, and after discharge in October 1945, uh, and armed with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, veterans rights uh, 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 I've forgotten the name for it anymore I, I uh, was launched um, in, in uh, what was what was a, a direction that had become increasingly clear uh, namely medical school and I and I think the uh, the reason that I was, uh, well, I, was, I was interested in medicine is that my mother had been a nurse and I thought uh, very highly of her. Uh, uh, and because she had a high regard for uh, doctors, I wanted to be one, probably for that uh, simple reason. So in um, uh, 1947, I, I received a BA degree and I was off to a medical school at Northwestern. After the uh, first two years, uh, I had developed a great interest in neuroscience, and then I dropped out of school for, the, uh, for almost a year and a half to do pure research in uh, neuroscience, uh, uh, which resulted in a PhD. After I dropped out again uh, uh, a year later, before my senior year, and then finally went back and got a degree and. Uh, uh, went to Johns Hopkins. Uh, there I uh, went into another uh, side alley in, of cardiac physiology uh, after uh, uh, we had encountered complete heart block in some of the early open heart operations um, uh, and needed uh, 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 to develop some way to uh, deal with that complication. So uh, I developed a model of complete heart block in dogs, studied the physiology, figured out how to do pacemaking, uh, and uh, solved the problem, then went back. Uh, and during the uh, rest of my residency, which part of which was at Hopkins and the rest at the University of Miami, I developed an interest in metabolism. And um, in the course, of uh, pursuing that interest, uh, developed uh, models of, of uh, transplantation that involved either the liver alone or the liver with other abdominal viscera. So at that point was when you really developed your interest in transplantation biology? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the, uh, the experimental models were uh, uh, presented a tempting target for clinical use. Uh, but, it, uh, but at the time, uh, immunosuppression did not exist, so the uh, models uh, were in uh, unmodified animals, animals that uh, were, received no immunosuppression. So basically, the real opportunity here was for the first time to study the rejection patterns of, uh, liver, of liver allografts. The only uh, organ that had been studied in this way, or uh, to be specific, uh, in which uh, rejection had been uh, studied in any detail uh, uh, was the kidney at that time. And uh, 
experimental kidney transplantation had been studied from a histopathologic point of view only by two people, um, a Danish guy um, uh, named Morten Siemensen and an English uh, scientist named uh, W.J. Dempster. So um, the uh, path studies that we did uh, with the models uh, were the first of their kind, and, uh, and, and that was an important step. Now, one of the uh, interesting observations that uh, was made in, in those untreated animals that we encountered an occasional recipient who rejected, uh, who, became, who became jaundiced, and then spontaneously recovered, or started to recover. Um, and in those animals, the uh, pathology was remarkably changed after the reversal of rejection, after the chemical reversal of rejection, in that uh, the invading cells that were characteristic of uh, acute rejection just disappeared, and everything that we could see from that point on would look like uh, remodeling, uh, uh, regeneration and repair. So even before the availability of uh, immunosuppression, we, or I at least, uh, uh, had a very clear idea that rejection was potentially, even without treatment, uh, spontaneously uh, reversible. So um, uh, the second paper that I wrote um, and published in 1961 uh, has uh, a discussion that is preoccupied more about that, those unusual experiments than about all of the rest of the experiments because there was a clue. Right. Um, and, and it was the clue that, uh, the clue had a very uh, big, um, importance in uh, uh, the way I thought about rejection from that point, point onward. Then there was an, another uh, uh, clue, perhaps uh, uh, d divisible into, into two parts. One was we saw evidence uh, in the pathology of the of presence of donor cells of uh, what should have been graft-versus-host disease. Uh, infiltrating throughout the uh, tissues of the uh, recipient. Uh, but no evidence, no other evidence of, uh, no real evidence of graft versus host disease uh, damage. And then uh, by 19, um, uh, by 1959, uh, we also, or I also had developed a model of, of um, multivisceral transplantation in which the liver was transplanted with the intestine, pancreas, and, and the rest of the abdominal viscera. And in those experiments, uh, the rejection of these extra organs was much less than if the organs had been transplanted alone. And also the rejection in the liver itself uh, was more modest than if the liver had gone by, uh, had been put in by itself. So we had, um, uh, and those matters were discussed also at length in these early papers that did not involve immunosuppression at all. So uh, uh, this background of behavior of graphs, uh, uh, and specifically liver graphs, uh, or those that were tr organs that were transplanted with the liver, uh, uh, provided a, a, a platform up, upon which uh, uh, all of the later observations with immunosuppression could be uh, mounted, built on. Now, in preparation for this interview, I read a fair bit of the previous interviews that you'd get, you have given, and some of your biographies. And in one of the interviews you'd given in the past, you told the interviewer that there was a moment when you were facing so much uncertainty about the nature of your research that it was hard to get funding. So you didn't, you were finishing your clinical training with three small children. You had to take a trip and you had to spend the night either in a movie theater or on a park bench. And on one occasion you had to smuggle a lab rabbit out of your lab at Northwestern in order to... Oh, those were true stories. <laughs> so how did you weather that period of uncertainty and keep persevering in what must have been just an undaunting and difficult task to accomplish? 
Um, I don't know that I gave it the kind of deep thought that uh, uh, that you're uh, you're implying I should have had, <laughs> but uh, uh, somehow um, I uh, thought that everything was going to turn out all right. But I think that the, the greatest source of anxiety was not so practical as all that. Uh, I didn't know for sure what to do, and uh, so. Uh, I described in one of these little uh, things that were prepared for the Lasker Prize that uh, uh, that I referred to myself uh, at one time as a as a missile searching for a trajectory. Uh, uh, I was bursting with energy. I really wanted to do something that wasn't conventional, uh, wasn't going to be bread and butter uh, uh, surgery as a uh, as a uh, 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 means of making money, but I wanted to do something uh, important that would uh, uh, have, a, have a life of its own, that would endure. But what uh, to do? Uh, uh, I was, uh, I had come to be regarded as a dilettante, having gone through a PhD in neuroscience and then a PhD equivalent in working out the heart block problem, and here I was wandering around, not pursuing either either uh, uh, field. Um, I just didn't know what to do with myself, um, and um, I was also getting uh, pressure from my uh, father, who was getting sick of sending me money, <laughs> and uh, and I was getting pressure from uh, uh, from my uh, first wife's family. Uh, uh, who had means, but uh, they didn't like the idea of, 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 of uh, providing a dole. Uh, uh, and I was even more uncomfortable in accepting it, that kind of help. So uh, uh, the problem was uh, uh, really uh, what field I should be w w working in. And at that time, at the height of those concerns, uh, uh, when I went to Philadelphia, it was to be certified or to go through the examining process uh, that would make me a qualified thoracic surgeon. And now I had, and, and I had all those skills uh, uh, in cardiovascular surgery and in just about in every field uh, in general surgery uh, uh, that had been acquired over an educational period that had lasted from uh, the time that uh, uh, I got out of the Navy now for like 13 years a, a perpetual student syndrome or uh, a, a, a dilettante uh, syndrome. Well, I like to think of myself as a gifted dilettante, but being a dilettante in and of itself is not, not, not a good idea. Right. Now, once you did get a little bit of traction and you moved to the University of Colorado to... Well, I found the trajectory and, right. uh, and I found the trajectory at Northwestern uh, right. uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the transplant studies uh, because I spent um, uh, about two years of full-time duty, uh, uh, worked all day every day on that project uh, and then settled the uh, financial problem, not by doing surgery in the university hospitals because they were, they were opposed to full-time uh, faculty at that time. And um, uh, they didn't want to give me operating privileges at the, uh, at the university hospitals. So I developed a, a practice of uh, tertiary surgery at, um, a neighborhood at a neighborhood hospital called uh, Lutheran Deaconess Hospital, where I did all kinds of tertiary surgery, uh, and developed a, a a strong referral practice uh, there. So I was able to earn a hundred thousand dollars in a year, uh, doing a lot of big surgery. But I had a special relationship with them that allowed me to operate before the rest of the schedule. Uh, 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 began, began at the hospital, but it necessitated being there at five in the morning doing the cases so I could show up at the laboratory at nine o'clock. 
And right. uh, this went on for a while. Um, and uh, I think I described in the puzzle people how I really had, I was so tired um, by this uh, schedule that I didn't think that I would uh, be able to uh, live beyond the age of 40 if I, insist, if I kept this up. So um, it was at that point that uh, uh, an opportunity came to go to Colorado. And, and I took that, but it probably had about a fifth of the income that I was making in Chicago. And it was there that you started testing a cocktail of immunosuppressive drugs and yes. steroids together yeah. on your kidney yeah. transplant uh, Almost, well, no. Uh, well, we, the almost the first thing that was done uh, within the first few months of 1962 uh, was to obtain a uh, supply of, of the drug uh, from uh, 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 Upjohn, I think, was the uh, company. And um, uh, one of the uh, two investigators, uh, they, they both won a Nobel Prize for their, uh, uh, their work, uh, most, mostly on other than anti-rejection drugs. Um, they were working on, uh, uh, they were in the oncology field, and uh, the 6 mercaptopurine and the Imuran uh, uh, were byproducts of that research. So I obtained a supply of uh, uh, Imuran pro probably about a year after uh, 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 Roy had the drug and had tested it in uh, London and then with Joe Murray in Boston. And I uh, made some observations that were completely missed by the people that had their first crack at the drug. Uh, and those were Roy, the group at the University of Minnesota, Bob Good, uh, and in Richmond. And what they had done uh, was to use uh, the Imuran or the azathioprine from the time of operation, and then they put it together with a variety of other drugs, including uh, other cytotoxic drugs, but also they had tested it with uh, prednisone. And they began these secondary drugs at the same time as they started Imuran in their dogs and the uh, prednisone to get right to the point in uh, Roy's e experiments actually degraded the results, made them worse. So um, this led to an anti-steroid point of view um, uh, by most centers, in, 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 including the Brigham Group. But um, I had treated always with Imuran alone, and then only when rejection developed in the dogs did I add the steroids. And uh, I found that rejection was always reversible or essentially 95% uh, of the time was reversible. And that sometimes you could then stop the steroids. And in our experiments, because we had limited kennels, we always stopped our uh, drugs completely at 100 days. And to our amazement, most of the liver recipients did not reject. Hmm. Uh, and so this, these were the tools uh, that you could use to manipulate the immune system. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing that we showed is that if you pre-treated the animals with Imuran for a couple weeks before and then continued afterwards, uh, the results were about double the in survival, uh, what they were if you just started on the day of operation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that the conditions with which we uh, tested I Imuran were quite different than in the other centers, and it was that set of observations that uh, uh, prompted going forward with, uh, with the kidney program. Why kidney when the first interest was the uh, liver was that uh, uh, I realized that if we proceeded with the liver without making the kidney work that uh, it would be considered uh, borderline criminal. Uh, uh, and um, uh, that uh, the road to the liver had to lead through a successful uh, kidney program. The uh, kidney program actually, uh, the success of the uh, kidney trials uh, uh, far exceeded my expectations. Uh, and in fact, there were other times when 
the success has exceeded my expectation. But uh, um, uh, there were other times when uh, I regretted ever having taken the second step because the uh, accomplishment with the kidneys uh, was so startling and unexpected uh, as the first step that uh, if I had just pursued kidneys, uh, it, it, uh, it, it might have been a wiser decision. Right. Uh, uh, the first objective then was to make kidneys work, use that as the porthole uh, through which you could mount a, a liver program, which succeeded uh, at least at a proof of clinical principle uh, level in uh, 1967. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, between 1967 and the time I moved to uh, uh, Pittsburgh, or until the time that that uh, cyclosporin became available, uh, was 1967 to uh, the tail end of um, of. Uh, of, of, of uh, 1979. So there was a long period of time in which there were multiple successes, but the uh, survival rate was only 50%. Right. And uh, well, losing half the liver recipients, uh, uh, not just from loss of graft, but from death in the first, uh, uh, during the first year was, uh, uh, was a very tough uh, uh, pill to keep swallowing. And never during that more than a dozen years seeing any way that, uh, uh, that I could improve things. Uh, so I was completely dependent uh, on finding or having somebody else take the next step. And uh, so when Roy came up with cyclosporin uh, with a report in 1979, um, uh, I was all over the uh, uh, the company to uh, uh, to get a supply of the drugs and, and try it. And uh, uh, I did the first successful liver series uh, with the new drug while I was still in Colorado, and did um, 12 cases uh, and, and about 60 uh, kidney cases. So uh, the the uh, uh, liver cases were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. I did the cases in Colorado, wrote the paper after I arrived in Pittsburgh, and it uh, was published in uh, 1981 in the New England Journal. And it, uh, it began the avalanche that Roy described. Now, do you have any memories of particular patients during that period that really shaped the way that you approached going forward? Well, those, I remembered all of those patients as if they were family members. Um, and um, the, uh, the loss of, and the ones before too, uh, the, uh, the uh, proof of principle cases uh, uh, over, uh, over the period between 1967 and, and 1980 uh, were, uh, uh, very precious uh, people. They, uh, uh, I could never really get them off my mind. So that's a heavy burden to keep carrying then. Oh, I know, and it grows. It grows in layers. Right. Now, I've also read that um, many surgeons were intimidated by your speed and your skill and your uncompromising standards but yet you also had a legion of people that are very dedicated to you. So what was it like being a mentor during those days when you yourself were still uh, questioning what was the appropriate technique? Well, uh, first of all, the feelings are mutual. Uh, the, uh, I had nothing but respect um, and humility in my uh, uh, view of, of those people because they were some of the great, they turned into some of the great uh, surgeons and leaders in the world in their own right. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you can look at it in a uh, uh, almost whimsical way, um, uh, I, I see the development of liver transplantation like a, a, a patchwork quilt in which you can uh, each one of those people who actually um, 
stayed on and uh, worked on the problem, uh, uh, donated a, a little piece of their lives right there uh, on the quilt. So um, I, I, I uh, appreciate their uh, devotion, but it goes right back at them. Now, your father, R.F. Starzl, was a newspaper man and a prolific, for a while, science fiction writer. Um, did he ever think that some of your ideas bordered on the fantastical? No. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> He was pretty enthusiastic and even contributed his own little bit. Um, In what way? Well, for, uh, you can take that all the way back to the beginning. When I was uh, working in cardiac physiology, one of our, I was working on heart block, but at the same time I was uh, supposed to be working and, and was, uh, but at, at a second priority level on the development of a, a heart lung machine because they did not exist. And the first person that, to develop a heart-lung machine uh, was, a, a, the first group was a group at the University of Minnesota uh, headed by uh, uh, Walton Lillehei. But uh, they developed a, a bubble oxygenator. And uh, uh, I, my father uh, independently had proposed a bubble oxygenator and he made one. Uh, out of a cream can. Uh, bear in mind, we're, I'm from a small town in Iowa, and um, uh, there are a lot of cows around and a lot of cream cans. So uh, a cream can was an ideal uh, way for him to start in the development of a bubble oxygenator. And bubble oxygenators were used a lot uh, in the first open heart uh, procedures. So anyway, we went to Minnesota where we heard there was a bubble oxygenator and I was dumbfounded to find an instrument very similar to the one to the that he had can. sent me a year, about a year before, uh, 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 which was just as good. I turned right around, went back to Pittsburgh and checked, checked uh, to uh, Denver and, or to uh, Denver and checked it out and, and uh, it worked just as well uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, they, as, as theirs and I had ruined uh, his opportunity to do what he most wanted to do, which was to uh, make, a, make, a, make a contribution by ignoring uh, uh, what he had sent me. So um, uh, yeah, he, if he saw uh, uh, some objective, uh, however wild, uh, he tuned right in on it. Now, given that he was a writer and a newspaper man, it's not shocking that you also are a very prolific writer with several books and important textbooks and over 1,800 scientific articles. Do you have uh, a special affinity for the written word? Uh, yes, I, I think that would be accurate to say. Um, it was always easiest, and it is easiest up to the present day for me to transform thoughts uh, on, on, onto paper instead of trying. Some people have a great and wonderful uh, uh, fluence uh, in, in speaking. And I always feel clumsy about that. And when I talk to you, I'm automatically envisioning written sentences. And so it slows up my talk. Um, uh, so the written word was an escape from that. Uh, and also it was a, a filter because if you write things down um, at, at, before you expose them, you have a chance to do all kinds of corrections uh, before they uh, ever become visible to anyone else. And I like that. I like the, uh, uh, the care that you put into the written word and, and I don't like a situation where you write something down and immediately transmit it like with uh, email. So if uh, I always liked the facts in uh, uh, collaborations with people who were off at a distance because uh, the facts automatically imposed uh, a requirement of, of editing before you let the words go. So um, uh, the, I gave you the straightforward answer at the beginning. Yes, writing is my preferred way of uh, communication. 
Now we've just come from the Lasker Award Luncheon where together with Sir Roy Khan you were awarded the Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical uh, Research Award recognizing the great strides that both of you took towards uh, successful liver transplantation. I imagine that must be tremendously gratifying to see the um, recognition by your peers. Well, it was. Uh, it it uh, came, as I also remarked, uh, really unusually late in life uh, for us. Roy, Roy is uh, uh, 82 or 84, I've forgotten uh, which. And I'm maybe three or, three or four years older than he is, uh, coming up 87. So um, uh, uh, there is some advantage to uh, having this occur so late because it always kept the fire burning uh, hotter than it would have if something like this had happened uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, as, as the sort of final uh, step in a, uh, uh, in a long uh, career, uh, uh, it probably uh, doesn't have quite the impact as it would have if it had occurred a quarter of a century ago or 20 years ago. Because uh, tw 20 years ago, uh, liver transplantation was over the top um, cleanly. Uh, and 20 years ago, um, maybe even a little longer th than that, kidney transplantation was over the top. But, um, uh, and Roy and I were involved uh, in the co-development of two organs side by side uh, from the uh, mid 1960s onward. So you you can't uh, envision liver transplantation as an achievement in and of itself uh, because it was dependent on the development side by side of uh, kidney transplantation. So, um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm just stalling uh, uh, because I was excited. Uh, uh, to be notified uh, that the uh, Lasker Prize had come down um, uh, and um, uh, de uh, delighted would be, uh, would be an, an apt word. Now a quick last question then. Did you ever consider a different career other than being a doctor? And surgeon? Uh, no, I don't think I ever did. I, by the time I was uh, 10 or 12 years old I was going to the hospital, uh, the only one in, in Lamar's, Iowa, and uh, watching a, a surgeon named uh, Downing. Uh, uh, he was a general practitioner who, who was also a quite skillful sur uh, surgeon doing major operations, radical mastectomies and other procedures. And uh, uh, he was quite surprised. I went to his office and asked him if I could come up and uh, watch his operations. And uh, he allowed me to do that, taking pains to uh, be able to cart a fainted body out of the room, uh, mm. which didn't occur. And I remember very distinctly some things that he pointed out as he was carrying out uh, uh, operations like radical mastectomy. Uh, here is a long thoracic nerve of Bell and, and other anatomic features. So uh, I never, uh, I don't believe I ever considered any other pathway from the time I was a sub-teenager onward. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay.